If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech too. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Charles Johnson, who is the director of the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility's Task Force on Nuclear Power. <laughs> he has been a political activist, legislative assistant, university uh, fundraiser, and a political biographer. He co-wrote and was a statewide organizer of Oregon's Ballot Measure 7 in 1980, which placed a moratorium on the construction of nuclear power plants in Oregon. He was also arrested and jailed for civil disobedience at the Trojan Nuclear Power Plant, uh, also here in Oregon. So uh, welcome to our show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, yeah. David. Good, good. Uh, so talk a little bit about where your origins, uh, wh where did this interest in nuclear power and the dangers come from? Well, uh, I, you know, was at an, in college in the 1970s when nuclear power was really beginning to uh, grow very rapidly in the United States and uh, became aware as a college student of some of the hazards involved in it um, and uh, uh, did some of my own research with, with friends into the, uh, the issue and we, we were facing, uh, w one plant had been built by the time I sort of figured out that I was opposed to nuclear energy, the Trojan nuclear plant. Here, here in Oregon. And uh, they were planning two more for Eastern Oregon in, in Arlington on the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. And I got active with a group called Trojan Decommissioning Alliance and we uh, did some actions at the Trojan plant. And then we later, some of us later focused our effort along with Lloyd Marbet in opposing the, um, the construction of the additional plants and were successful in 1980, as you said, mm -hmm. in stopping any more from being built. Um, and at that point, I, I moved on to other issues, but others fortunately kept working on that. I, I give uh, Mr. Marbet and several others credit for hounding Portland General Electric until they managed to mm -hmm. get Trojan shut down. Mm -hmm. and, and of course they uh, were unsuccessful with all of their initiative campaigns to close it, but PGE was forced to close it uh, because of faulty piping, as I recall? They had, yeah, they had a major repair bill uh, with uh, their, their turbine. They had several hundred million dollars worth of repair and were going to be facing ballot measures every two years. So they just decided to cut their losses and, and, and uh, they convinced the Oregon Public Utility Commission to give them some financial credit and then that was fought out for years. But they, mm -hmm. they decided to cut their losses at that point. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there was one little piece of unfinished business from that whole era. There, across the river in Washington state, uh, the uh, a consortium of public utilities called the Washington Public Power Supply System some people may remember WHOOPS, that was their acronym. Right. Uh -huh. uh, they were attempting to build uh, five nuclear plants at the same time. Um, and the f last two, WHOOPS 4 and 5, actually defaulted. Uh, and it was the largest municipal bond default in U.S. history prior to recent days. Uh, so for another 30 years, it held the record. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, unfortunately, I would say, uh, one of the, of the five plants was completed on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, the former Whoops 2 plant, and that's now still running, and they, they renamed it and they call it the Columbia Generating Station. Okay, and, and interesting that they don't put nuclear in the name. They took the name nuclear out of it uh, in 1999 when uh -huh. they changed the name from Whoops to Energy Northwest, so the consortium is no longer called Whoops, and the plant <laughs> is no longer called a nuclear plant. <laughs> right, yeah, so the best defense is hiding. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. Uh, talk about uh, uh, Fukushima and the tsunami and what happened uh, in Japan. Uh, was that a couple years ago now? Yes, it was two and a half years ago. It was March of 2011. Uh, there was a, uh, an earthquake uh, in the uh, Pacific off the coast of Japan, the west coast of Japan, and, or the east coast of Japan, excuse me. 
and uh, a very large tsunami wave was generated from it that swept through and, and killed, I think it was somewhere around 25,000 people um, and destroyed a lot of property. It also wiped out uh, the uh, electrical power and the, uh, the systems for, for uh, uh, water cooling of, uh, of six nuclear plants, uh, four of which were, um, three of which were running and a fourth was, uh, had very hot fuel in it that was, ended up being damaged in the explosions that mm -hmm. came days after this, uh, the power was knocked out. And what, what happened was that nuclear fuel, when it's inside of a reactor, beca becomes so extremely hot that it cannot uh, go for a very long time. Really, it's a matter of hours that it needs to ha maintain cooling water to it. Otherwise, it begins to melt and hydrogen gas is formed from the zirconium as it, as it uh, melts down. And this hydrogen gas is very explosive. We had uh, three hydrogen explosions that came from, uh, from these plants, and three of the plants melted down. Okay, and, and, and one of those was the Fukushima, or were there others? No, Fukushima, oh, is, Fukushima. A, is a group of six. It's actually Fukushima Daiichi which means uh, Fukushima number one. Uh. And there, were, there was Fukushima Daini, Fukushima number two, that's at a, at a separate location. Those plants didn't suffer uh, that sa the same damage. But this is six plants located in one place. This, the Fukushima accident involved a, a, uh, okay. a bank of six nuclear power mm -hmm. plants. And then in Japan, there are other nuclear plants spread across the country, because Japan has traditionally gotten, or not traditionally, but uh, in the modern era has gotten most of their energy from nuclear? No, well they got a significant amount. They, significant. they used to have about 30 percent of their electricity from nuclear power, um, which is a larger stake. The United States gets about 20 percent of its electricity, a little less now, uh -huh. uh, from nuclear power. Um, they had 56 plants that were running. There are currently none that are running right now. Um, there were two that they started up, but those are down for refueling again. Uh, but ever since that accident, um, as these plants have needed refueling and been shut down, the local people have resisted the, the central government's desire to start these plants back up again. And so one by one, they all closed and they haven't reopened them. Oh, okay. And, and there's a lot of resistance on the, on the local Absolutely. population. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's something, uh, you know, on the order of Fukushima, you know, and the danger there and all those people having to be evacuated, people do wake up. <laughs> well, that's it. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, prior to this accident, the people living around the plant were probably the most supportive of nuclear energy uh, of any of the people in Japan. And that's true of everywhere. You know, you have a local industry, you're going to be very loyal. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be supportive. They're paying local taxes. They're hiring a lot of the local people. Um, but obviously, one bad day at a nuclear plant can change all that, right. and that's oh. what happened. That was one. All it takes is one bad day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. trouble with nuclear power. Yeah, yeah. It seems like you know, obviously, when that accident first happened, there was a lot of press about it, but I don't really see a whole lot of press anymore about that. Um, it's still periodically in the press. Most recently, over the summer, there was quite a bit of press about uh, leaking water uh, mm -hmm. from the plants and. Uh, uh, what's been going on is that they've had to, because all of their, their systems for, for running coolant water were broken, they've had to just pour seawater on top of these plants through jerry-rigged systems for, for uh, the last two and a half years. And um, that creates a lot of water <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that then uh, they gets into the groundwater, and they've been trying to then recapture it and put it into makeshift tanks that they've been storing this in. Uh, further and further away from the plants, they're creating these ta tank farms. Well, they built these tank farms in such a hurry that some of them, some of the tanks were poorly made and they're starting to break down uh -huh. and okay, which water's is, leaking out of them. Yeah, and I, I see that these tanks, that the, 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 uh, there's a requirement or a need to store this water for a very long period of time. Well, the problem with with what this wa contained in this water. The initial explosions um, 
were strong enough to blow a lot of cesium into the atmosphere, and some of which came all the way across the Pacific and landed in North America and traveled all the way around the world in the Northern Hemisphere. Small amounts, mm -hmm. um, but, but measurable. Uh, and radioactive iodine, which breaks down very quickly. Those are lighter elements. Some of the heavier elements didn't make it all the way across the Pacific. Strontium-90 is one of the most dangerous elements uh, in nuclear uh, waste. And um, it, uh, it is a calcium replacer. Your body doesn't know the difference between strontium-90 and calcium. Oh. So it can cause uh, leukemia and bone cancers. It's oh. a really very, very bad uh, element to, to have in the environment. And it's unfortunately a major constituent of what's now going into the harbor in, uh, around Fukushima okay. and getting into the uh, aquatic life there. They're, they, they can now measure strontium-90 in the fish that they're catching and oh, so forth off, okay. the, uh, off the coast there. Okay. And what about fish that's being caught off, of, off the coast of Oregon, for instance? So far as I know, uh, you know, the Washington State was, uh, did a, uh, uh, some testing last year of salmon in the Columbia River and they found cesium from Fukushima in it, in mm -hmm. small amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, cesium uh, is, um, it, it shows up in mus muscle tissue. It's a potassium imitator. Oh, okay. Um, and um, it, uh, but it also gets flushed by the body a lot quicker. So the good news, the bad news is that a lot of it got out. The good news is that they, they found Tuna, for example, off the coast of California that had cesium from Fukushima in it, um, they were amazed to do that because the, the rate of excretion should have meant that they wouldn't have found any, uh -huh. according to what the, the scientists uh -huh. who were looking at it thought. Mm -hmm. But there was very little. Uh, however, if you're catching that fish off of Japan, uh, you know, you're talking about 100 times or even 1,000 times the safe dose of, of uh, the safe, the, the allowable dose, I should say, <laughs> right. of, oh, uh, yeah. of radioactive materials oh. in the fish. And the Japanese authorities are, have certain areas that they're no longer allowing fishing right now. Oh, okay. All right. Let, let, let's go back to those leaking tanks. Uh, I, I was reading that uh, one, of the, one of the suggested solutions to the leaking water is to build a frozen barrier. Talk about that. Right. Um, the... Uh, Right. One of the things, well, the problems that they're having, in addition to pouring all this water from the ocean on the reactors, they also have the natural flow of groundwater that's coming off the highlands through the plant site mm -hmm. and then getting into the ocean. And they're, they're trying to tra they've been trying to trap it with a dike, but it's starting to overflow the dike. That's, uh -huh. that's the problem. Uh -huh. So what their, their plan is to uh, use this, this technique that they've used in, in some places, but never on a scale like this, where they would freeze a, a sort of a, a frozen wall underneath uh, all the way around the plant, and it would, it would gar the groundwater would hit that frozen wall and either adhere to it or, or pass off into the ocean and not go through the contaminated uh -huh. area. Uh, in theory, you know, it could work, but it's going to take years for this to actually be put in place. And, We'll see if it actually works okay. or not. All right. Yeah. And then the, I, I was also reading there's some concern that uh, the owners of Fukushima wanted to do this, but they didn't really have any experience in actually doing it themselves. That's true. Right. Um, this is something that the Japanese government has said that they're going to help uh, TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, uh, accomplish. Uh -huh. uh, the problem with TEPCO is that, of course, from the start, they've been extremely embarrassed about this situation, and and they they and it's and their company is being bankrupted by it. Um, so they've they've tried to limit their costs and downplay the accident from the start. Uh, mm -hmm. They should not be at this point in charge of it at all, in right. my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And the, there's been some uh, calls for international support for getting this under control. Senator Wyden uh, about. Gosh, I think it was uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, visited Fukushima, and he was concerned, even more concerned about the spent fuel pool at reactor number four. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a really dangerous situation. Probably the most dangerous situation on the plant site. And it's uh, with these spent fuel pools. If you if you look at a schematic, you can see that the uh, this GE boiling water reactor 
uh, puts the pools above grade, about, about five stories up. And uh, this, in this pool is what they call spent fuel. It really should be called highly irradiated spent fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no longer useful in the plant, but it's actually hotter when it first comes in there than it was much hotter than when it first entered the plant because it's been sitting in a reactor getting irradiated. Mm -hmm. It takes uh, five years for it to cool down enough for them to even move it out uh, to put into, into dry cask storage. It has to stay in this pool to cool down. Mm -hmm. And this reactor number four had a hydrogen explosion in it that, that damaged the pool. There's also a possibility that the earthquake itself crack, caused a crack in the pool. But for whatever reason, water drained out of that pool and some of the fuel got melted. And that pool is shaky and there's some concern that if there was another really big earthquake, that that pool could collapse and release you know, five, six, seven times as much radiation as, as what was initially released uh -huh. in, the, in the first series of accidents. Okay. And Wyden was calling. He, Wyden uh, wrote a letter to the Japanese Prime Minister, to the President of the United States and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's requesting that they agree to uh, form an international task force of scientists to come there and, and figure out the best way to deal with this uh, spent fuel situation. Uh, it was ignored. Um, TEPCO is, does have plans this year to try and empty that, that pool. Um, and there's a lot of concern among, among scientists that with the destruction that's happened there already that it's going to be very difficult to pull these rods out without having them accidentally break apart and then uh -huh. possibly trigger an accident. Uh -huh. Okay. Any, any other um, uh, scenarios of problems that could happen in the next uh, That's say, the big one. Or? That's really okay. the big one. The rest is, is just the question of uh, to what extent will these destroyed reactors continue to, uh, will the groundwater and water, uh, keeping them cool, continue to, to get into the Pacific Ocean? And uh -huh. to what extent does our Pacific Ocean get contaminated by this ongoing accident? Uh -huh. it, to, to say that it was an accident that happened two and a half years ago is not entirely accurate. It's, it's still so ongoing. hot there that mm -hmm. they have to continue to pour water on it. It's an ongoing accident. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think let's, uh, talk about that, well, you talked about the, the storage being five stories high. Yeah. That particular design is here at the Columbia Generating Station also on, on the Columbia River. So to talk about the comparisons of those two. Well, that was the thing that got me interested in getting back involved in, in the nuclear power issue again, uh, was after the Fukushima accident. I mean, a number of us have been aware that this Whoops 2 nuclear power plant had changed its name and, but was still operating in, uh, on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Um, and, but when this accident happened and we realized it was the same design as the ones that failed in Japan, we, we realized that we needed to do something about it. And uh, I went to uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and they were already organizing uh, a, a group. Uh, here in Oregon, and then I discovered that one was was forming also out of the Washington PSR chapter located in Seattle. So we merged forces and have begun studying this particular plant, trying to figure out if it has the potential for having this kind of accident. And we believe it does, uh, unfortunately. Um, some people say, well, of course, you can't have a tsunami out in uh, the desert. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so how could you possibly have an accident like in Japan? Well, the trouble with that thinking is that when you think about the last accident, you're not necessarily thinking about potentially what could go wrong. I know that the Japanese did not think that the tsunami would, would go over their, uh, the break wall that yeah, they yeah. built. Uh -huh. They didn't think that was possible or credible. Uh, these days, we hear from the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and from Energy Northwest, which runs this reactor, that they don't believe that there's a sizable enough earthquake to harm their reactor. And yet, uh, the United States Geological Sur Survey and also the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, in looking at the Hanford site, have now uh, discovered that uh, the length of faults, the depth of faults, the, the recent history of faulting in that area, 
the larger number of faults than they knew about when the plant was originally built. They estimate that it's about three, you could get a, 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 an earthquake that would be three times as large as what they originally planned that reactor to withstand. Hmm. And that's probably the single most important concern that we have that we're in the process of talking with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about and trying to force them to do something about and also talking to the owners of the plants. Uh, the, owner of the, the owners of this plant are the people who live in 27 uh, uh, utility districts in Washington State and includes the municipality of Seattle. So oh. the city of mm -hmm. Seattle, the city of Tacoma, which has a municipal electric uh, utility as well, um, Clark County, People's Utility District across the river from here, uh, Klickitat uh, County across mm -hmm. the river from us, um, all along the Columbia River, we have these uh, PUDs, and uh, so their their boards uh, elect members to this uh, Energy Northwest board that mm -hmm. decides whether or not to keep running this nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. And it's, so they, they are essentially the decision makers on that, but who actually buys the electricity that's generating from there? Well, that was an interesting thing. You know, when they originally planned these plants, Bonneville Power Administration thought that we were going to need somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 nuclear power plants by the year uh, 2000. And so they had a very aggressive plan. They called it the hydrothermal plan. Um, in which they ramped up 10 reactors as sort of the down payment. Uh, five of them would be publicly built, five of them would be privately built, and uh, the five public ones, they wanted to guarantee that these utilities would not have trouble, you know, they wanted to encourage them to do this, so they mm -hmm. set up an agreement with them to buy the power from them. Mm -hmm. uh, the first three uh, reactors had what they call the net billing agreement. Um, and they, um, so Bonneville buys all of that nuclear power from the one reactor. We also pay for two of the others that were never finished. Uh -huh. um, in fact, about 18% of our uh, electricity, the cost of our electricity from Bonneville goes to paying for the uh -huh. two plants that aren't, that were never finished. Uh -huh. And about 17% goes to paying for this one that, that was finished. Wow, okay. And, and so, in terms of the, we're almost done. I'm, yeah. I'm, unfortunately, I got yeah. my signals out here a little <laughs> slow. <laughs> um, of the energy that we use in the Pacific Northwest, how much of that energy comes from this nuclear plant? Only 4%. And uh, it's, uh, it was shut down for uh, nearly six months when they did a ma major repair in 2011 and uh, it was not noticed. And in fact, we've had an economist, Robert McCullough, who's a very well-known utility economist, do an analysis for us. And uh, we're, we're going to issue his report very soon, but we've been collecting information from Bonneville and from Energy Northwest. And uh, he, he knows, he can show that for the last five years, we've been paying more money for that nuclear plant than if we'd closed it and replaced that power in other ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and his projections show that this would continue to be true. So this would be a very good time economically for us to close this reactor uh -huh. uh, and not incur any additional expenses or the risks of whether or not you know, we, we might have a bad earthquake or something else might cause that reactor to right. melt down. Okay, all right. And in terms of talking to the citizens of Portland, Oregon, or Vancouver, or in this whole region, what could I do or what could well, in, uh, for the citizens of Portland, um, I think the most important thing would be to, to contact Governor Kitzhaber and just make it clear to him that, that uh, through our regional power agencies that we should be uh, urging the shutdown of this reactor as rapidly as possible. Mm -hmm. If you live in Clark County or anywhere on the other side of the river or you know anyone who lives there, you should encourage them to contact their uh, PUD commission and talk to them and say, you know, you have the power to close this reactor. It doesn't supply that much energy, um, but it's a risk and we don't need it. Thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you, David. Right. Our guest today has been uh, Charles Johnson, director of the Task Force on Nuclear Power of the Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibilities. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking with Leslie, Leslie Marsh 
uh, March. And Leslie is on the steering committee of the Sierra Club's nuclear free campaign. Uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about nuclear power also and something called the nuclear confidence rule. So uh, a couple of weeks, be sure you, you uh, tune in then to hear her. Uh, join the Alliance for Democracy for a screening of A Fierce Green Fire, The Battle for a Living Planet. Narrated by Robert Redford, Ashley Judge, Judd, uh, Van Jones, and others, this documentary is a big picture exploration of the environmental movement spanning 50 years from conservation to climate change, from halting dams in the Grand Canyon to building uh, to battling 20,000 tons of toxic waste at Love Canal, uh, from Greenpeace saving whales to the rubber tappers saving the Amazon. This film tells vivid stories about people fighting and succeeding against enormous odds. This Alliance for Democracy sponsored screening will be at the First Unitarian Church in Portland, located at 12th and Salmon, starting at 1230, uh, excuse me, starting at 630 on Sunday, November 10th. So if you want to experience a full range of emotions and would be motivated to act uh, for the environment, this is the movie to see. And we're uh, very pleased that we'll be joined afterwards by the director, Mark Kitcher, as well as our guest today, Charles uh, Johnson, for a panel discussion. Uh, don't forget you can watch Populous Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populousdialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notice. Populous Dialogues is now being seen in places, more places across the nation. In addition, our viewers here in Oregon Cable access stations in Modesto and Sacramento, California are able, are able now to watch each week. And they are joining folks in Spokane, Boston, Sheboygan, Urbana, and elsewhere. So welcome to all those new viewers. You can help us expand our viewership even further. Contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Such suggestions are usually quite welcome. Populous Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thanks to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me We want to build a movement. We really need a movement of people to offset and to get rid of the corporate influence. It's our country. We need to take it back.